20. Luke 20. <coughs> right. Okay, now we're going to have my quickest sermon of the year. <laughs> so far, well, shortest. Well, quickest. Well, maybe I can do the whole sermon, but at double speed. Right when you press that thing on the podcast. Right, I can do it. We're going to play it back. Play it back at normal. <laughs> that would be interesting. Well, fantastic. It is lovely to have Rain Armour in the isn't it? Fantastic. I think of you actually frequently because when I, almost every time I drive home, I drive past Charlotte Bromwin's house, which is two streets away from where we are, and your old car is sitting on, <laughs> sitting outside because you sold them your old car, right? So, so there it is. So I think of you frequently as I drive past. That's a good thing, you know. Um, so where are we in Luke? We are in uh, Luke 20, and we're talking about picking Jesus. Okay, pick Jesus. Uh, let me ask a quick question. So in many people's minds, or perhaps in your own, what's the problem with authority? And people, you know, put up the word, or you talk about authority with people, and it's often seen as a problem. So what's the problem with authority? Trust. Trust, a lack of trust in authority, lack of difficulty in trusting authority. Okay, what else? I'm sorry? Not agreeing with those in authority. Okay. How things are implemented. Okay, might think it's a good, some good ideas, but how? The actual practicality of how things are done. Yes, okay. Okay. A lack of freedom. A lack of freedom that comes with the implementation of yeah. the authority of, okay, yeah. reducing, restricting our own freedoms that we might want to have. Yes, good. Anything else? A frustration that those up there don't understand what it's like for those down here. There speaks a teacher. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we're not going to get into political or, things or today. Or Downton Abbey fan. Or, or <laughs> Downton Abbey fan. Right, okay, okay. <laughs> so, trying our best to stay away from political things too much, <laughs> as much as we can, and not getting too political. But it's interesting, because what we're looking at today is a passage that actually, in many ways, is about politics. 2,000 years ago. And what we see is that things haven't changed very much. So, why don't we read our passage here in Luke 20, verse 1. And let's see what happened. Luke 20, verse 1. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it amongst themselves and said, and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us. Because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, we don't know where it was from. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. I mean, the, the Pharisees, we're going to read on in a minute, but the Pharisees' uh, response here is a perfect political answer. Yeah. Right? They, don't want, they, don't, they can't say one thing because of fear of one thing, and they can't say <coughs> one for fear of another, and so they, they say nothing really in the end. So, this is what we have here with uh, Jesus uh, facing this issue and the Pharisees avoid coming down on one side or the other. The Pharisees are super sceptical about Jesus' authority. And I don't think much has changed. Still today, there's great scepticism, not just about authority as a concept, but about Jesus' authority. And we encounter people, we talk to people, our friends and family and neighbours and work colleagues, who are very sceptical about Jesus. And his authority. Isn't he one religious guy amongst many? Aren't his teachings equal with Buddha, uh, with the uh, Baghdad Vita of the, uh, the Hindu scriptures, or, or, or Muhammad? Or, I mean, why, why should he have authority? And there's a great skepticism if we claim that Jesus has authority beyond these other uh, religious leaders and teachers, or, or secular people, or the claims of atheism. And, and we do believe that Jesus is the ultimate authority, but how do we get this across? And, and I think we face the same kind of challenges that, um, that, they had in, that Jesus had in his own day. So, I'm going to talk about this challenge here in a moment. Let me ask you another question. So, today, 
when we talk to people, why, why is it that people struggle to, 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 to allow Jesus to have the authority, to see him as, a, <clears throat> as an authority on how life should be lived, on morals, on what happens after we die? What do you think is the reason, yeah, Liam? I think today's society is very keen for us all to have our own personal authority over ourselves and nobody else to have authority over us. Okay, so it's not even necessarily just about Jesus as such, in a way, it's just about anybody who claims that. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Any other particular reasons you think why people struggle with saying, okay, all right, Jesus can have, I'll, I'll give him that authority or I'll accept that he has this authority. Anything in particular? What might be the struggle here. Okay. That's a super point, isn't it? It's the, the lack of willingness to change. That isn't, that, isn't that what we see with the Pharisees? Is they had their way of doing things. They were set with it. It worked for them. They weren't about to allow someone to challenge the way they lived, the way they thought about God. Barry? We also have to try and within ourselves so that we don't want to change and give up our authority over ourselves. Right. We don't feel the need to. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. Yes. Any anything else? Dan? I think in some ways, when we've got our own control, we know what to expect. We know we think we know what to expect, but mm -hmm. we hand that over to somebody else. There's a hesitancy because we don't know what to expect. We don't know. It's like facing a big Jump right. off a bit. Like Jesus might it. take us in a direction we didn't realize he was going to take us and we might not like it. The unknown. Okay, the unknown. Fear of the unknown, yeah. yeah I would say fear. Fear is a big, it's a big thing. It's fear yes. of the unknown. Fear of this person going to take care of me. Fear is huge, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, were well, you going to add to that? that fear of being perceived as weak. I mean, there's fear of being weak, maybe, and then there's fear of being perceived as, as weak. So, okay, let's read on the rest of the chapter, or the passage here, and then we'll pull together a few points and pray and have a good time of fellowship. <coughs> so, let's pick it up in verse 9, carry on the situation here. He went on, this is Jesus, <coughs> to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the, <coughs> of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. He sent another servant but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent him away empty handed. He sent still a third and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid... Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But... They were afraid of the people. Fear is a bit of a thread through this, isn't it? 
fear and control, I would say. We see in this parable a great illustration of God's patience and man's desire for control. Let's dig in a little bit. So who do we suppose the, uh, the owner of the vineyard represents in this parable? God. That would be God. Yeah, okay. And the servants in the, not the servants, the, um, sorry, the tenants, who would they be? Israelites, Israelite nation, yes, right, okay. What about the, uh, the people that come to uh, get some of the fruit at harvest time? Who might they be? Sorry? Prophets. Could be prophets. Yeah, it's less clear that that's a prophetic function, collecting the fruit. Prophets more often came as people to warn the Israelites of things. But nonetheless, it could be the, the, the God's messengers like, uh, uh, like, like prophets or something like that. And the son of in the... Sorry, Jesus, right? Clearly, when he told the parable, it may not have been clear to the people who heard it first time that that was referring to him directly as the Son of God, but it may have done, and certainly we can see that that is the, uh, the application or the interpretation that seems to fit best now from our perspective. And so, um, just a bit of context. So, this was a common thing that happened absentee landlords, a long way away, very common in, in the days of Jesus. And the, um, if you're a tenant, um, what's that thing about um, ownership is nine tenths of the Lord? Thank you very much. Okay. And possession is nine tenths of the Lord. Thank you. And in this culture, in this context, it was like 9.9 tenths. We do have our own remote farmer here. We have, a, we have our own remote have farmer here. Remote farmer, that's true. We have yeah. a. Ah! <laughs> we do! That's a remote well, yeah, I don't know. If I'm in Nigeria, yeah, that's, that's a fair distance. Okay. Um, I don't know how you're going to treat the people that work on your farm. And anyway, but it's, it's not, we'll, talk about it. we'll talk about that. Okay. <laughs> Maybe some guidance in this scripture right here. So, but it was, and so the, you had, it was like 9.9 possessions. You know, it, it really, you had a lot of rights if you were a tenant farmer in those days. And when they, they send, then the sun arrives, their assumption, it seems to be, from reading this, but also it would be the assumption, that uh, the owner must be dead. He's died in this foreign land, so that's why he sent his son. So they're thinking, of course, if they kill the son, then they absolutely get this all for themselves. It's about control. It's about self-determining, if you like, authority. I want to have control. Israel wanted to be the Israel it wanted to be in connection with the... Uh, the powers around, the other nations, the other religions of the day. They, they wanted to fit in. Not all Israelites did, but in general, they gave in to the pressures that were around them and the pagan religions and all that. And that's, that's the problem. Now Jesus has come, Messiah has come, the Son has come, and he's rejected, even though he's the Son. It's, um, it's a challenge, and then there are consequences, as we can see. Consequences are dire, as the the owner then comes and says, right, well, we're going to kill that lot. And uh, that's the situation. And, and the interesting reaction of the crowd is, God forbid. Now, why do you think that's a strong reaction, given that the owner would be well within his rights to do this? So it's not like the, the owner <laughs> is, is proposing to do something that would not look right in that culture, in that context. So, and yet, the people listening to the parable say, when we get to the sort of punchline of he will come and kill those ter- tenants and give the vineyard to others, they say, God forbid. What do you suppose is going on there? Why would they react so strongly? God forbid. Any ideas? Barry? Just the, that, well, that could be us. It's hitting home, perhaps, yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Other people could be God's people, but yeah. not them. Yes. And maybe it's about the reaction about the whole situation, like how could this be? How could this situation ever got into, the, into this state in the first place? How could people right. kill? The, 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 how, could, how could the authority be ignored so much? How could they kill their their right. the owners? 
people, like, how, how could this happen? How could this have got to this state? Got to this stage, yeah. Yeah, surely something could have been resolved earlier than this, or, man, yeah, it's a, appalling it's got to this point. Marissa? Yeah, it's quite brutal. When I was sitting there, I think, Farzers, you're going to go and kill all these people. That is pretty brutal. It would be it would probably appear less brutal in that context at that time, but nonetheless, it certainly is. Yes. Yeah. I think it's something, it's all connected to all of these things, but it's something particularly connected to the idea that Israel had assumed this is ours. It's our land, this is our way of doing things, and it's going to continue forever until the Messiah that we want comes, the one who will fight the Romans and give us our land back and, and we'll have you know, self-determination. But instead, actually this land may be given to others, to other nations, to Gentiles mm -hmm. perhaps. That's, I think that's the core no. And it, it's a warning about complacency. And I think it's important, you know, there's no reason for us not to be secure in Christ. So I'm not talking about living an insecure life. That's not what God wants. God does not want us he doesn't enjoy or want us to walk around in our lives wondering, am I saved? Am I right with God? Am I going to be okay? I, mean, I think a, a deep sense of security in our salvation and in our rightness with God is something that is a gift God gives and wishes to give to all people. So that having been said, nonetheless, there are times for us all to be sober and think, am I, am I really pleasing God? Am I recognizing the authority of Jesus in my life. Not just the time when I studied the Bible and understood this years ago. Not just the day that I know I repented. Not just the day I know I got baptized for the forgiveness of my sins. Not just those days, but actually today, this year later, this five years, this decade or two later, is the authority of Jesus still the primary authority in my life? <coughs> is he the one with all authority? All authority in heaven and earth has, has been given to me, Jesus said. Is he still the authority? Does he still ultimately shape all our moral choices? All our moral choices, all our decisions about where we live and what jobs we take. And do, do we, do we, I know that he doesn't necessarily tell us all these things, but do we, do we willingly, consciously submit those decisions to him? Does he have the authority that he deserves, frankly? Uh, there are consequences. The consequences for us, but also for the world around us, and thinking about what happened in London. I mean, the, uh, last night, it, it's, it's tragic, it's awful. Um, these things would not happen if people submitted to the authority of Jesus in their lives. The stuff that we see around us, I read in the uh, Watford Observer this week, uh, a 14-year-old boy was, was beaten up um, in the centre of, of Watford by some random people. He was randomly chosen, broke his jaw, he had to... See, so feeding through us like liquids for several weeks. And, I mean, just randomly in in Watford. I doesn't com say it doesn't compare to what happened in in London last night. No, it doesn't. But what I'm saying is, it's it's not just terrorist events in London. It's around us, right? Yesterday, Penny and I went to the Open Garden Day for the charity New Hope here in Watford that I'm connected with and volunteer with, and I had a great time there, uh, serving and helping. I was part of the kitchen staff washing up teacups and things and uh, I did I, I washed up I washed up a lot of teacups <laughs> and plates and handed out cake and uh, and tea and didn't eat any of the cake I was you know it was, it was tough but you know um, but to be there surrounded by people who have severe addiction issues and their families because a lot of them, this is the day their families come. Their aunts, their uncles. I met the godparents of one of the people that's staying in this home. And, uh, and it was a lovely day. And I share this with you not to say, you know, that, look at those terrible people. This is any of us, right? What I share it with us is to remind us that around us, in our next door neighbor's house, in the person who sits on the desk next to us, there are things in their lives that have caused great pain to them and to others that we aren't entirely protected from because we have our own follies that sometimes we have our consequences from. But at least Jesus helps us, gives us the strength and pr protects us from so many more folly, foolish things and the consequences of those that we otherwise would have done if we hadn't found him. 
if we haven't let him be the authority in our lives? And could we not have a vision to share the positive nature of letting the authority of Jesus into your life? I mean, part of what it means to be a Christian and share our faith is to say, let me tell you what he's done and the blessings of living under his authority <coughs> is meant to me. And then sh share that so that others can enjoy the authority of Jesus. So the authority of Jesus should never be a burden. It can be a challenge, because sometimes, as you said, he takes us where, at places we didn't mean to go or want to go. But, but it's always a blessing. It's always for our benefit. It's always because God loves us and wants the best for us. I think that's really what it's about. In this parable, even though it's tough, God is generous. He gives them a vision. <coughs> He is patient. He sends person after person over a long period of time. He's persevering in that he keeps going even when his messengers are not only ignored and rejected, but they're beaten and then finally his son is killed. We see a lot about God's goodness here. I think then it's up to us to decide how to respond. I'm not going to talk about politics, but people die because of pollution. There'd be a lot less pollution if everybody lived under the authority of Jesus. The NHS funding issues um, would not be as acute if not so many people lived lives of foolish decisions in the way they eat and drink and smoke. I mean, I, to me, <coughs> if you like, that, the solution to the NHS funding crisis would be for people to live with less folly in their lives. Then we'd have plenty of money. The same with policing issues. And this is, again, not about pointing the finger. It's just about the reality. Yeah. We can make a difference. I don't know if my vote on Thursday will make much difference. I will go and vote because I believe in that. Mm. And even more so since last night's events. Yeah. Mm. But, that's, but even if my vote doesn't make a material difference, my life can make a difference. Because mm. Jesus can make a difference. That's why we share our faith. And that's why we do what we do. So just uh, to finish off, it's like working now after its little accident. So, um, just, just to sum it up, we seek the authority of Jesus, we seek him, we accept the authority of Jesus, and then we bring ourselves to, in service to him, because that produces the fruit he's talking about from the vineyard, and then that helps everybody else. Hope that's helpful. Amen. Yeah. Thanks.